So our theme for today, or at least for the first part today, is to characterize neoclassical characteristics of focusing on images of war and violence. Okay, so the theme. Um, the theme for um, neoclassicism and romanticism is called Enlightenment and Revolution, Head versus the Heart. And so we went over some of this the other day, um, talking about how after the Rococo, right? After the Rococo, um, there was a backlash. And a big reason for the backlash was the thing that we call the Enlightenment is often coined as the Age of Reason. Um, after all of that overindulgence by people like Louis the Fourteenth and the you know monarchy after him, um, the people, right? And these were things that were kind of brought on by the people. They really wanted to get back to things like logic, ethics. We see the rise of democracy during this time, as well as capitalism. And so remember that this is the time of the American Revolution first, and then a series of French revolutions. Right. Um, and with that, we have a lot of humanist characteristics again. Right. This idea that man can achieve and that men and people, right, common people, can overcome larger powers. So, what would be larger powers that the common person can overcome? What do you think? What would be what? The French and the Americans during the revolution were overcome. You can throw it in the chat if you like. Who runs the government before democracy? in America. Who runs the government? I'm waiting for some more answers. There we go, the monarchy. And so that larger power is the monarchy. In some places, the larger power would be the church too, the so places like Italy. Um, so when you look at our theme, the head represents neoclassicism. And so in that, they value order, and then artworks that are solemn and calm and rational. The subject matter is often Greek or Roman history placed in that time. So people are normally dressed or the architecture is dressed as if they are in classical time. So we see the resurgence of toga, right? We see lots of classical drapery and toga. The technique, when it comes to painting and drawing in particular, they tended to stress realism and an emphasis on line work with limited color. Now we're going to see color, but color isn't necessarily going to be bright and vivid. Um, and then brush stroke is going to be eliminated. So remember how Rococo had all that feathery brush stroke? In neoclassicism, it tends to be very smooth, very, very smooth. And the role of art was to be morally uplifting and inspirational. So artwork was made to make you feel things like patriotism, right? And then the compositions typically are balanced on horizontal and vertical elements. Because things that are vertical are very stoic, and things that are horizontal are very tranquil, right? And so we have a lot of vertical and horizontal elements in the artworks. So a good example of that is one that we'll go over today called The Oath of the Palatia by Jacques W. You can see that it's based on a Roman story. It has Roman architecture. It's got Roman clothing. Okay. Back in the days when we could be close to each other, we used to do a living painting in this unit. So students used to dress up and we would recreate famous stories from um, Roman and classical 
history. Right? The next one is the heart, right? So the heart stands for romanticism, which values intuition, emotion, and imagination. So you can see it's a little bit different than we just saw with the solemn artworks of the neoclassical. The inspiration for romanticism is often based on medieval literature, the Baroque eras, um, some of the influence of colonialism, so this idea of exotic locations, so things from the Middle or the Far East, nature, and so we see the rise of landscapes um, during this time as well. The, top, the tone of paintings is often subjective, spontaneous, and nonconformist. The subject matter is often based on contemporary events, legends, exotic, exotica, nature, or violence. So instead of being based on the past, it's based on contemporary history or things that are going on right now, as well as literature based on all of these other things. The color tends to be really deep and vivid. So we're going to have a lot of bright colors, strong light, um, strong contrast between light and dark. It's very baroque in its drama of lighting. And the technique is often with visible brush strokes um, with that contrast of light. And sometimes in the composition, rather than having the vertical and horizontal elements, there's a lot of uh, diagonals. So a good example of that is the Raft of the Medusa by Jericho. It is not in the 250, but it definitely should be. So this one, has a lot of drama to it. It's kind of like Hellenistic in a way, right? It's full of drama. It's got the diagonal moving from the bottom left to the upper right. Okay. Now, when I speak about neoclassical and romanticism, I don't want you to think that they are islands. It doesn't mean that all works of art are going to be one or the other. They could be. Some paintings are definitely neoclassical. Some artworks are definitely romantic. But there are going to be a lot of crossover, right? There's going to be a lot of crossover that's going to have both romantic tendencies and um, neoclassical tendencies. So like Liberty and Meeting the People, we normally think of it being romantic. Right, because it's based on contemporary events, it's based on one of the revolutions. But the uh, liberty here is a classical personification, and she even has like a classical new sort of framework with half of her clothing kind of falling off of her. So it does have classical as well as romantic tendencies. So keep in mind that with the Enlightenment. We already talked about this before. We have subject matter changing. So things like science, right? History painting, like contemporary history painting. Um, here's a portrait about the little hair. Kind of feels like Roman realism to me. And then the teaching of morality that's um, kind of all anti rococo right? And so the effects on art is that we have Winkleman, right, writing that first art historical book, and he coined the phrase noble simplicity and home grandeur. We have Dennis Diderot, a major artist. He attacked the Rococo style. And then we have the elevation of the natural man, focusing on rural and peasant life. We looked at some of those examples in the class on Tuesday. So let's look at our theme of war and violence. What do you think the subject matter is based on? What do you think the subject matter is based on? How is it neoclassical? Right? This is the Weaselman effect. Um, he's that Prussian art historian. And so what he did is he wrote about classicism and about how that being the perfect representation of art. And so other artists started to 
models. So this is actually painted in a Roman villa, right? And so we have a classical nude, we have classical drapery, we've got classical subject matter. They love the third century Apollo Belvedere, um, which is a like a late classical Greek sculpture. And it was the model for a lot of artwork during this time period. Even some images that we'll later see of George Washington, our first president. Right? Um, this is the sister of Louis the 15th. And so you can see that she is looking like she is a, she's a contemporary person, right? However, she's shown in sculpture as someone who is classical. So if you guys remember on Tuesday, we looked a little bit at art academies. Okay, art academies were like the first like groups. They did have like schooling, but also it was almost like a fraternity or a group of men who like kind of worked together. It's like a society of artists. And under Louis the 14th, we had a man named Charles Lebrun. And he and like future academies decided to rate art and artists based on how great they were. So what is considered to be the highest art form and what is considered to be the lowest art form. And so the art academies of the day were pushing arts that model the highest form. So the highest form would be artwork from classical Greece, Raphael, right, the Renaissance artist Raphael, and Nicholas Poussin, who we'll see today. The lower, right, the like, like pretty much low on the list were things like Venetian artists and Michelangelo, right? Does anyone know why Michelangelo, one of the greatest artists of all time, would be so like ranked so low by the academy? Any guesses? Any ideas? If you think about Michelangelo, his artwork is super emotional. Very emotional. Raphael is very kind of calming, right? Very calming, very stoic, very grand. And Michelangelo is grand in scale, but it tends to be very dramatic, very emotional. And that would, you know, according to the, the academy, Artwork shouldn't be like that. And then the lowest of the low would be people like the Dutch and the Flemish painters because they were doing genre scenes, scenes with everyday people, still lifes, that sort of thing. There's actually a list in your textbook if you're really curious about the subject matter, about who in our book and, and how are they ranked according to the academy. It's on page 799. So in the academies and in the art world in Europe during this time, there was a series of artists who were followers of Poussin, so Nicolas Poussin. The upper left is an example of his work. They were the conservatives. They wanted art to appeal to a, like a few people. Art was not made for the masses. It was for the intellectuals who were elite. This is your snobby art, right? And that art should appeal to the mind. Then there was another group of artists who were the Rubenists, and they were much more liberal and free. They wanted artwork that was much more emotional. Um, they loved art that was based on rich color and expressive brushstroke. And so they loved the artwork of Rubens. So what happens is that people who like who saw it tend to be neoclassical in style. And the people who like Rubens tend to be more romantic and stuff. Um, besides the academies, we also have art contests during this day. And the major art contest uh, in France of the day was called the Salon. And that was the Prix de Vero, with the award that you would win. So if you won the Salon, you would get to go study art in Rome for a whole year. And in art, we often call this arrangement of paintings in a room, when there's kind of like a lot of paintings all in a room um, staff rather than one artwork 
Take space, another artwork, take space, another artwork. Okay, and that's kind of your typical museum. Sometimes when you go to see an art exhibit or you go to a gallery or to an exhibition of student or student or professional artwork, sometimes there's just a lot of art on the wall. And we call that the lab style. So the arranging of artwork where there's image after image after image and they're stacked on top of each other comes from these contacts that France would put on in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And so one of the winners of Prix de Rome was Nicolas Cavat, and he won the race of the Sabine. So how do you think his work was inspired by that year that he spent in Rome? Go ahead and take a few moments in the chat and write, how do you think he was inspired by his life in Rome? Look for visual evidence in the painting. Am I doing the door? They're all kind of lots of learning active poses, right? And so they, they, they're not stiff, they're full of action. Good. Let's see in the chat, I don't see it. Classical architecture, good. Um, I mean, this looks like a classical temple on the upper left, right? Look like it could be the front course of the Pantheon. We've got rounded arches. We've got the classical togas, very good. So we've got clothing as well. So Jacques-Louis David, who is a follower of Poussin, made an update. When I say update, he basically made a painting that was inspired by um, Rousseau, or excuse me, Poussin. And so here's his. Notice his has some romantic tendencies to it, right? How is this one more, more romantic? What's, what's the architecture here? Is that a classical temple in the background? Is that a classical temple? Isn't that gothic? That's a castle. So remember that romantic tendencies can peek in some of these subject matter that are actually classical. So here we have a, a uh, medieval castle in the background there, the very dramatic sort of rose lighting. Notice how it's very anti rococo right? There's no, it, there's smooth value, right? There's dark, rich color or dark, dramatic color rather than the pastels of the Rococo, right? It's smooth, not feathery, right? So that leads us to 103, which is the Old Southern Rachei by Jacques-Louis David, right? And this is an example of a history painting. How does the scale of the artwork show its intention, right? Look at how big this painting is. Right? This is in the Louvre in Paris. And paintings from this time period are enormous. Now, they're not murals like the Sistine Chapel, but they're really, really big. And so they thought history painting, which is the grandest, most elevated art of the time period, the most important art that should be made, was really, really big. It's intentionally painted enormous to show its importance. So, what we're going to do is we're going to watch um, the video. And while we're watching the video, we want to think about how it's neoclassical, which should be probably pretty easy by just looking at it. What's the story? We're going to get the story from Smart History today, so the content of it, and then what's its function.
We're standing in one of the largest galleries in the Louvre in Paris. It's filled with enormous paintings. We're looking at Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Horatio. This is a painting that was made in 1784 and exhibited in 1785. And this painting stole the show. It was absolutely new. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. The prevailing style in France was the Rococo. You can think about artists like Mouché or Fragonard, a style that appeals to the aristocracy. And even in the kind of history painting that was made for the king, the style had become formulaic. It had become tired. But David's Oath of the Horatii establishes a new style that we call neoclassicism. Critics like Diderot are calling for an art that depicts virtuous behavior, very different from the prevailing Rococo style. And this painting answers that call. This is the tail end of the period in France that we call the Enlightenment, with philosophers like Rousseau, Diderot, and Voltaire, who posit the idea that the rational should supersede tradition and the spiritual. The church was incredibly powerful. The monarchy in France was incredibly powerful. And the philosophers of the Enlightenment are asking questions about the validity of these very established institutions. And remember, it will only be a few years before the French Revolution begins. Right. This is exhibited in 1785, the revolution in 1789. And the American Revolution has already taken place, based in large part on the ideas of French Enlightenment philosophers. We have a story from early ancient Roman history. The early Roman state is at war with the neighboring city of Alba. But instead of the armies of each side going to war, they decide to send three brothers from each side to battle it out. Whoever survives is the side that's victorious. The Romans choose the Horatii, and the city of Alba chooses the Horatii. But things get very complicated because there are intermarriages between these two families. So no matter who wins, both sides will lose. Exactly. What we see is the father of the Horatii holding swords aloft as the sons take an oath to battle to the death. For Rome. On the right, we see three women and two children. There's some disagreement as to who the woman in blue is in the back. We see two young women in the foreground. One of them is a Horatii sister, and she's married to one of the Horatii brothers. The other is a Horatii by birth, but will marry one of the Horatii. Families will be torn apart by this battle. No matter what happens. By making the women appear so curvilinear, so passive, they don't even have their eyes open. David is suggesting an idea that was very prevalent in the philosophy of Rousseau, for example, that women could not be true citizens of the state. They were unable to think about civic responsibility. Women could only think about the personal and the familial. And look at how David has depicted that contrast. If women are curvilinear, if their bodies are limp, the male figures are rigid, they are upright, they are tall, they are strong. They are angular in the forms of their bodies. They raise their arms together. There's a sense of purpose that is completely absent from the women who appear to be just victims of circumstance here. The young men are working in unison. Their arms salute in unison. There is clearly a reverence for the idea of strength in a kind of brotherhood, in a kind of collective. David represents all of this in a classical, classicizing style, looking back to ancient Greece and Rome. There is an interest in the anatomy of the body, of carefully depicting the musculature, the movement of the body, that is directly from ancient Greek and Roman art. In fact, the lighting, which rakes across the surface, reminds me of an ancient Greek or Roman relief carving. And all of this is set within a simplified stone interior with rounded Roman arches, simplified Tuscan columns, and a pavement that creates a geometric stage for these figures. And if we follow the orthogonal lines created by that pavement, we end at a vanishing point. Right where the father's hand clasps the swords. If we think about the lushness, the luxuriousness of Rococo painting, to me, this painting is the exact opposite. It's one that speaks of the virtue of simplicity over the indulgence of Rococo style, exactly what the Enlightenment philosophers were calling for artists to do. 
and audiences recognized that stark contrast. In fact, the salon had to stay open longer than it had originally been scheduled just to accommodate the numbers of people that wanted to see it. One of the most fascinating things about this painting is that during the revolution, the brothers and their willingness to die for their country resonates with the revolutionaries who must make sacrifices of themselves and their families for the ideals of the revolution. And David does become a revolutionary himself, and so it's very tempting to read back into this painting. But we have to remember that the painting was completed several years before the revolution, although it was certainly informed by the same philosophical values that the revolution was founded on. Davi not only becomes a revolutionary, he votes for the beheading of the king. We're talking about an artist who is very politically engaged. And this painting becomes an icon for the revolution. When I look at this painting, I sense that patriotic fervor that must have been so palpable in the early years of the revolution when people were able to rise up against the abuses of a monarchy and to begin to imagine a republic for France. It has classical architectural elements in the background. I think they say it was like Tuscan columns. It's got basically, you know, Doric Tuscan columns, rounded arches. What else about neoclassical? Someone turned on their mic earlier. I cut them off. Who was that? Oh, yeah, I was going to say like um, the drapery and like the poses. Very good. Thank you, Isabel. So they're wearing togas, right? Um, and then the subject matter is also classical. So what's the story? What's taking place? What is this based on? What's the subject matter of this painting? What did they say? I think. Well, I Video said, I think the video said that there was a war between Rome and Alba, so they each sent three men, and they were like two sets of brothers whose families were kind of interconnected. Right, and I believe it's in our textbook. They talk about that there was a very famous play of the day, so a contemporary play based on the same theme. So it would be a story that a lot of people living in the city primarily would know because of this very famous play. So it's based on Roman history, a contemporary Parisian play, and then the function of it is to incite basically patriotism, right? And of course, this was made in the day where it was probably more patriotism for like the monarchy, but we have all that influence of you know, the enlightenment taking place. So things are starting to happen where it's like you sacrifice yourself for the good of others, right? So these brothers giving up themselves in order to, um, you know, defend their homeland. Um, David obviously knew the artwork of Poussin and he intentionally used the red cape man in the center of the composition. Here in the Rape of the St. Davis, this is the more famous version of this. Notice how we have this noble man on the upper left wearing a red cape. Um, because red is pretty rich, right? It's a really rich color, but he's using it to reference a famous painting as well. Right? So when we look at this painting, there's a lot of contrasting imagery. We have the Stoic brothers. 
and the emotional women, right? And so it's playing on stereotypes where men are calm and rational and women are full of emotion. So these are kind of like contempt their contemporary thoughts of the day. Right? This is the death of Socrates by David. And one of the things to notice about this painting is it's really based on that incorporation of horizontal and vertical elements. Obviously, Socrates was a classical philosopher. So the subject matter is classical, the costume, the architecture is. But when we look at it, we see that he is in a horizontal plane on that bed, right, about to take the poison. We have this lamp post that's vertical. We have his shoulder is horizontal. We have him vertical. We have his arm at a 90 degree angle. And then the emotional people are on a curve. And that's really common of this style of art, where people who are calm and rational are horizontal and vertical, and then dramatic, then the emotional people are diagonal. So even though this, these arms kind of angle up, right, there's still in the front a horizontal element in the foreground, right? And the father is leaning back, but he's centrally located. He's very stoic. So there's often this balance of horizontal and vertical elements. Right? Uh, a very famous painting by David is Death of Noah. And this was painted during the revolution. He becomes a revolutionary. So he worked for the monarchy. He worked for the revolution. He even worked later for Napoleon. He was, uh, I don't want to I want to say he was a turncoat, but he basically was always this look like the whoever was in power of the day. Um, because he's an artist and he needed to, you know, obviously make a living. So so he actually becomes a revolutionary. And so Marat was a writer and he was a um, you know a revolutionary, and he was hiding in the sewers of Paris. So to to stay away from authority, he's hiding in sewers. And he happened to have a horrible skin condition, and he would have to take these baths. So actually, this is an image of him taking a bath, and a woman comes into the sewer one night and kills him. Um, she was partial to the, the monarchy, and she murdered him. So David actually knew Mara, went to the death scene and made a bunch of sketches. And so this is based on him seeing the body, but then also, of course, he elevates the status of this revolutionary, right, by using Caravaggio tendencies. What are the Caravaggio tendencies here? Our Baroque artist Caravaggio. What do you think? Alana, do you see any Baroque characteristics? Um, there's a spotlight on the figure, and the colors have a very uh, stark contrast. There's dramatic lighting. There's a spotlight. The, the colors are very kind of like brown. Like there's some rich color here and there with the green, but it's very like earthy, right, and brown, which is very common of the Baroque period. So he makes Marat kind of like a Christ-like figure, sacrificing himself for the good of the country. So, um, yeah, this is a little outdated, but Andrew Bird, a local, a local musician, he recreated this a few years ago in his album, album cover. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our next theme. And we're going to be looking at how class and society is represented in the Enlightenment in England. So we're going to be looking at the English painting. Right? So we're going to start first with the English Academy. So the Academy that we've been talking about first uh, so far has been centralized in Paris, in France. England had their own Academy. And so this is one of the leaders of the Academy, Sir Joshua Reynolds. And what style do you think he was influenced when he painted this, this uh, portrait? What style 
file from the state before that might influence this. I think there might be more than one. What do you think? Raheel, you have educated yet? Um, I mean, there are some like gothic elements, I would say. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the end of that. I saw that. Uh, could you say that again? I didn't catch what you said. I'm sorry. Um, I said that there were some gothic elements to it. Right. There's kind of like gothic, very dark, dramatic, dark imagery in the back. Um, how would you characterize the lighting? Aaron, how would you characterize the lighting? What's it like? Can you describe it? Uh, there's only very small streams of light coming in and on the woman and everything else in the background is dark. Right. It's very baroque light, right? It's very baroque where there's a spotlight illuminating what's most important, which is her face. Um, this is a portrait of Simeon, who, or Mrs. Simeon, who was a very famous um, actress of the day. And so she's in a very theatrical pose. Baroque lighting. And then the brush strokes, it's a little bit harder to tell, but he was a little bit influenced by Rococo as well. Um, and we'll see that in some other examples. Um, the English um, Academy was a little different than Paris. In England, they were also interested in portraiture, and they often wanted to elevate portrait painting to a similar status to history painting. History painting would be things like Death of the Horatii, or this is um, Benjamin West. He actually was the first American painter who came of considerable fame. Um, he left America to go to, to England to have more fame. So he had to actually leave America because America was kind of a know nothing country at the time. And so he had to leave to find work. And so he actually becomes an expat. He, goes back to England and paints these uh, historical paintings. But here, with Reynolds on the side, he's trying to elevate the status of portrait painting. And one of the ways that they do this is by trying to make the subject matter of the portrait painting more classical. So a very common theme of this day was the good mother, right? So here we have a wife and mother giving a tribute to a classical sculpture of the three graces. You might remember the three graces from Botticelli's painting. They, are, they symbolize the perfect wife, right? The attributes of a perfect, perfect wife. So here we see a woman giving tribute to the God to help her become a good wife. And a lot of these paintings are like not just portraits, heads, but they're like full body portraits too. And they were quite large in scale. This is Gainsborough on the left. And this is uh, Reynolds on the right. And this is the same actress. So this is Mrs. Sidian, a very famous actress. You can see that Gainsborough has a little bit more of that feathery Rococo style. But he was another famous English Academy painter. Here's more wispy portrait by um, Gainsborough. And his fam most famous one is this one called a conversation piece. And basically, what we have is wealthy landowners, right? So here we have wealthy landowners. There's basically a portion of them superimposed in front of their land. And it's all about showing them and displaying their wealth, right? That they're able to own all the land that you see in the horizon. So that leads us to some of our morality paintings. And so Hogarth, William Hogarth, um, he was a painter as well as a printmaker who made a series of paintings. They kind of read like a novel. They were stories and they go from one image to the next. And they always have like some sort of moral teaching at the end. So the race progress is about a race, right? So man who's kind of sowing his wild oats. And so it basically shows 
Because he lives a horrible lifestyle, he's basically leading himself to poverty and death. So it's always about trying to elevate. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide and conquer in our study guide. So if you go to study guide 95, right, study guide 95, if you look at the study guide, there is based on um, Hobart, there's questions one through 12. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a number and you're going to listen for the answer as we watch the video. So Isabella Zhao, you're number one. Jasmine, you're number two. Brianna, you're number three. Cora, you're number four. Quana, you're number five. Erin, you're number six. Jeffrey, you're number seven. Isabella, you're number eight. Katie, you're number nine. Raheel, you're number um, 11. Alana, you're number 12. I feel like someone disappeared. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. Um, Isabel, you can listen to number one too. Okay, does anyone have a number? Can I skip anyone? Okay. The study guide. Fill in the answers as you go. You will not watch this whole video. It is quite long. 12 minutes, but we will watch this. We're in the National Gallery in London, and we're looking at a set of six paintings by William Hogarth who's best known for making prints, not paintings. 18th century is an interesting moment, especially in England and France, where we have the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, and as a result, a widening middle class that wants to buy art. We have the landed aristocracy, which is in some ways beginning to lose power to a new merchant class that is becoming powerful because it's becoming wealthy. So whereas before he had art that was serving the aristocracy, princes, monarchs, the church, we now begin to have art that is made for this growing middle class audience. And we have prints that are being sold to a wide public and art becoming a commodity, something that large numbers of people buy. And prints are a lot less expensive than paintings. And Wolgar's intent here was to use these paintings as a model, the prints that he was going to produce, and then he would sell his prints for about a shilling a piece. Now that was more than a working class person could afford, but it was well within the means of this new middle class. So Hogarth is becoming a kind of artist entrepreneur, something that might be very familiar to us in the 21st century. And art is still so closely allied to commerce, to galleries, to money making. And this is so targeted to that new middle class because it is a completely moral set of images. But it's also a set of images that is full of fun and makes fun. Um, so the entire set is known as marriage a la mode and it's prompted by this concern in the 18th century that marriages were sometimes arranged for economic benefit rather than for love. Marriage a la mode means modern marriage or the marriage of the day. The entire series, these six paintings, tell the story of an aristocratic family named wonderfully the Squander Fields, suggesting that they squandered their aristocratic fortune. And Lord Squanderfield has to have his son marry the daughter of a wealthy merchant so he can maintain his estate and all his worldly possessions. And the wealthy merchant's daughter gets in return the aristocratic title. So what we have is an exchange. It is a kind of economic deal that's taking place. It's being brokered here. So let's look at the painting. On the right, we see Lord Squanderfield. He's pointing to his family tree, which begins with the medieval knight, suggesting what he's bringing to the table is this great lineage. Over on the far left, you see his son in blue, and he's picking some snuff out of a box, and he looks really like a dilettante. Well, he's actually looking in the mirror, too, sort of gazing at his own reflection. So we have no sympathy for him whatsoever. And the woman behind him, who he's going to marry, he has his back to. He's not paying any attention to her. This is an arranged marriage. The woman is being talked into it. Someone we're going to see later in the story. His name is Silvertongue. 
and he's a counselor. So clearly Hogarth is making fun of him and talking about him as a kind of smooth talker. What's interesting is that the way that Lawrence Wander feels with his gout-ridden foot, he's situated in between the family tree and this dowry that is being paid. And he's saying, look, I'm bringing a lot to the table here. I've got this long aristocratic lineage. This money that's piled up, this isn't even enough for me. Well, that's because if you look out the window, he's building a new mansion and he needs to finance that. We see a lawyer at the table, and we also see the merchant himself, that is, that young woman's father, and they're attending to the business transaction. But the architect stares out the window at the building that he's dreaming of constructing. So everybody is in this for their own self interest, with the exception of the young couple. The young man, self involved, the young woman looks inconsolable. But these two individuals will add to the disaster that is their end here. So let's move to the second canvas. This is tete a tete, which means head to head, face to face. The husband has come home from a night of you know, gambling and drinking and, and womanizing. And womanizing. So how can we tell? Well, the dog's sniffing at what looks like a woman's bonnet in his pocket. And he looks like he hasn't slept at all. But his wife looks like she's had some fun of her own while her husband was away. Her bodice is undone. She looks flirtatious as though perhaps her lover has just left when her husband's come home. She seems to be signaling with a mirror held above her head to her lover, perhaps. The chair is overturned and instruments on the floor. A music book is open. There's an implication that lovemaking has taken place here and it's just ended when the husband has come home. And music was a traditional symbol of pleasure. And sensuality and lovemaking. And in the room just past where they are, we see images of saints. So we have Hogarth commenting on the immorality of this couple. To make sure that we don't miss these signals, Hogarth has placed a third figure in the foreground. He's a kind of accountant, and you can see that he's had it. He holds receipts, he holds bills, and he's thrown his hands up. He can't get this young couple to take their finances seriously. And if you look at the mantelpiece, we've got all sorts of knickknacks lined up there that look like they've been recently purchased and look inexpensive and gaudy compared to this aristocratic environment with these oil paintings and gilded frames. Well, that's the contrast that's important, I think, for Hogarth here. He's making this sharp distinction between these tawdry things that they've brought in, this young couple, and the classicism that is a part of this aristocratic life. The aristocracy has this reputation that they've inherited, these values that have accrued to them over centuries, but they're values that don't reflect the reality of their lives. You can also see an addition, perhaps a painting that the man has brought in. It's partially obscured by a curtain, and all that's visible is a nude foot. On a bed, On a bed. And so this would have been a very clear signal in the 18th century to a lewd painting. So in all of these paintings, actually, the artwork really tells a meta story. They comment on a scene that is being enacted, and we can see that right over the mantle. We have a classical sculpture, but its nose is broken, as if it had been knocked over at some party. And behind it, a painting of Cupid among the ruins, that is, love itself is here ruined. Love itself has become a disaster. Let's look at the third painting. This canvas is called The Inspection, and it takes place in a doctor's office. The apothecary, the doctor on the left, seems to be cleaning his glasses, which makes one worried about the kind of inspection he's going to perform. And the woman behind him is obviously his assistant, but they're both clearly suffering from syphilis. This is an important point. Lord Squanderfield, the younger Lord Squanderfield, actually has a sign of syphilis, which is that large black form on his neck. And we see that throughout his canvases. And so we know he is likely visiting prostitutes. He is living a life of debauchery right from the beginning and clearly infecting his young life. And here clearly has infected a young woman who he's brought with him to the doctor's office who seems to be applying some kind of ointment to a sore on her mouth. I mean, it's, it's just, it's ghastly. And so Hogarth is doing everything he can to remove any kind of sympathy he can possibly have for this young man. He seems to be saying to the apothecary, your medicine isn't working. Give me my money back. Well, the woman seems to be quite angered by that, whereas the apothecary himself seems to be not particularly concerned. But look at the kind of caricature that Hogarth brings to the rendering of these figures. The apothecary himself, that's just a disreputable face. But again, the surroundings tell us something about the figures. In the medical cabinet, we see a model of a human figure next to a skeletal model. And even on the left side, we see a skull, which is also a symbol of death. But no one is taking seriously the fact that they're going to die one day. 
In fact, the young Lord Spongerfield here seems to be in a very good mood. Let's move on to the fourth canvas. And this one, I'm going to kind of skip through the rest of it just a little bit, but you can see how this was a series of paintings. It was a series of prints first. And so we talked about printmaking before and what the benefits of printmaking are, right? What's the benefits to printmaking? The benefits to printmaking. You can mass produce the artwork. Right. You can mass produce the artwork. So when you look at the amount of detail, right? You were just talking about all that detail in each of these paintings. They're all about like spelling out a, a complete story. And so they're trying the best they can to show like if you live an unseemly life, a life of debauchery, what's going to happen to you, right? You're going to like ruin your marriage. You're going to get syphilis. Here we have the woman, right? This one is the woman in her bedroom. She's basically getting dressed for the day, and all of these people are kind of mooching off of her. And here's Wanderfield over here, right? Like this is like this lawyer is all over there, and they're like, you know, just kind of like hanging out there, right? Eventually, she has a child. Get through. We can see, um, actually, we're not there as a child yet. We actually can see that um, the lover gets a sword through him. Can you see how he's wounded right here? And he's like sneaking out. This is like, I think the husband or the whatever. And someone's sneaking out the window. So, like, there's like, it's a soap opera. It's like full of drama here. And here we actually have the woman dead. Right, so that lively, pretty maiden that we saw at the very beginning, by the end of the story, she dies, and her child is upset about it. And notice how the child has a mark of syphilis on it, right? And so Hogarth is trying to paint these or print these pictures of these lives of debauchery, um, and trying to educate people on what they should, how they should lead their life. So let's go ahead and go through the study guide and kind of read off the answers okay so number one what i'd like you to do is to read the question and then fill in the blank for number one okay see how well this works go ahead yep um william hogarth intended to use these paintings and models to make prints to sell to rising middle class um and these cost about one shilling each so that was, which was beyond the reach of the working class, but within the means of the new middle class. The series targeted the middle class because of its deep morals and satirical narratives that poke fun of the aristocracy. Okay, so just the, for the next one, just talk just a little bit louder so everyone can hear. So the filling in the blanks was print and moral. Number two, who had number two? Uh, I did, so it, Ask what does the phrase marriage uh, mode mean? And it means modern marriage or marriage of the day. Right. So that's probably important content to know for that subject matter. Good. Number three. The Lord's son is looking at a mirror and picking. I wasn't sure. This is like stuff out of a box. And the woman who shows no interest in her husband to be is being coerced by a lawyer named Silver Tongue to go along with this arranged marriage. Right. It's called snuff. It's basically tobacco. It's kind of like chew tobacco that they would put in their cheek. Good. So snuff is S N U F F. Or just knowing tobacco is probably good enough too. Number four. Um, a marriage is being arranged by Lord Squanderfield, who offers his son in matrimony to the daughter of a wealthy merchant. The merchant presents a dowry. The Lord looks towards his family trees to suggest that he is offering his prestigious lineage in exchange for money to finish his mansion. So this shows the blending of these classes. So we have this, like, um, excuse me. So we have this merchant class marrying an older aristocratic class. So this new class merging with old classes of wealth. Good. Number five. T 
tet, a tet means head to head or face to face. Right. So that basically alludes to a private conversation. So private conversation. Good. Uh, number six. Uh, the young man apparently had been all, out all night with another woman. This is indicated by the fact that a dog is sniffing a woman's bonnet in the man's pocket. Right. So that's one of those like, symbols of his infidelity. Good. Number seven. Uh, the wife bears a flirtatious look as she holds a mirror uh, to her head, like used to signal to her lover. Her, her bondness is undone just as the chair to the left is overturned. Good. Number eight. Anyone have number eight? Last chance, number eight. Music is a traditional symbol of pleasure or love making to suggest while the husband was out during the night, the wife was engaged in an affair. Number nine. The steward walks away with a stack of receipts and bills, aware that his attempts to convince the young couple to take care of their financial affairs are useless. Right, so they're, they're having way too much fun that they're becoming in to go and do that. Number 10. Number 10. Yeah, number 10. Next to a row of paintings depicting religious saints is a painting partially exposed from behind a curtain. The painting is likely a depiction of nude in a bed, a reference of the couple's immorality and genius taste. So that's going to be in the style of like the Venus of Urbino. Remember, the Venus of Urbino had that Titian, which was that nude image of a woman, right? That, that we'll get start to see more of those um, happening as well in French painting. Number 11. Um, I didn't get the whole thing, but I put the objects on the shelf above the fireplace alludes to the inferior love displayed by the young couple when contrasted with classical painting. And then the painting depicts Cupid among the ruins. And then it functions as a decaying state of the young couple's relationship. Right, so the gaudy objects, the painting is all alluding to their love, but it's also kind of showing Kind of the lack of, of love that their love is kind of like falling apart right because it's cupid in the ruins right they're creating their own ruin and then last one number 12. the spot on the young man's neck suggests syphilis which also suggests a life of debauchery there you go so hope i was painting these to teach morality right so they're all kind of based on this enlightenment thought and you know this kind of Reeks of what's to come in like things like Victorian England. So this kind of subject matter in England is taking place at the same time that we see, or in a similar time, I should say, to things that you saw at the end of the Rococo. So this idea of painting based on you know, classical nudity and so on, right? So the next artwork that we're going to look at is also in, influenced by um, the Enlightenment, and this is based on scientific investigation. What do you think was a major influence in the style of this artist? What time period do you think he used to create the drama in the scene? Baroque. Baroque. So this is not the one that we have. This one is actually really sad. This is the one that's in the textbook. Basically, this is what is, is illustrating what happens when you use a vacuum to remove oxygen. So there's actually a bird in a glass bowl kind of at the top, and they use the vacuum to remove the oxygen. And so this bird is dying, and these little kids and these people are watching it happen to learn about how we need oxygen to breathe, right? 
And so, of course, the young children are devastated to see this bird dying. And so this man in the center is opening the lid to kind of bring the bird back to life. It hasn't died yet. And so it's all based on scientific investigation with that Baroque dramatic light. Right? So that painting, as well as this one, was by jo Joseph Wright of Derby. And the image that we have in our 250 is a philosopher giving a lecture at the orrery. I lost my question because my thing is in chart in front of it. So, what's an orrery? What's an orrery? Does anyone know? It helps us to understand how the planets move and how the moon revolves. And so we can understand the phases of the moon. And this is what it actually looks like. So, it's a contraction that has where planets rotate, right? And the moon and so on. Right? And so Derby, or excuse me, right, was trying to elevate the scientific paintings to the status of history paintings. So they are quite large as well, right? And he broke lighting. So he uses the drama to illuminate, right, the orrery itself and those who are witnessing it working. So who is depicted, right? Who is depicted? So this image is based on real people. It's based on real people. Um, they're possibly members of the Lunar Society of Birmingham. So this would be a group of people who would meet together um, to study the moon. Um, taking notes on the far left was one of Wright's friends, Peter Perez de Burrick. Um, on the far right, we have the owner of the warrior. So this is the guy who owns the contraption, right? He is Washington Shirley. And then the guy in the center could possibly be Isaac Newton. We're not quite sure, but it was based on real scientists of the day. And so they're all turning and witnessing the magic of science, right? This new religion of the day. Uh, Wright did other paintings as well, so like um, how to use coal to heat and industrialization. There we go. Um, alchemy, this one just appeared on me. Got images of alchemy and so on. So they were all, you know, like this. Sometimes they were a little bit more mystical in nature. Okay. Um, so the last bit we have today is looking at historicism in architecture and how it relates to class and society. So in England, we see a lot of architecture based on um, Palladio. So Palladio, if you remember, was this architect who made this Venetian, or actually I think it's Verona, but Basically, it's an Italian country farm. And if you remember, this was kind of um, during the Mannerist time period, it was kind of like super artificial. Like, no one needs a farmhouse that looks like a classical temple. But the style influenced architecture of the day. So, this is a Palladian revival. So, that house that we just saw, instead of being perfect radial symmetry, it actually had vice. The bilateral symmetry. So if you divide it vertically, it's the same on both sides. Right? Notice it's not circles on all corners or rectangles on four, all corners, like that other house that we just saw. Right? Um, another thing that we had during this time period is that in English gardens, people would recreate ancient classical temples. And so the English garden is artificial. I want to make sure you guys know that. They would manuscripts the landscapes to look natural, right? So they might add a covered bridge, pathways, walkways, build up architecture, build up hills, right? They may actually make it even more beautiful. 
And in the midst of them, there were things like this. So you would happen upon a little classical sculpture, or excuse me, a building or a classical temple. And it was all arranged in this kind of beautiful naturalistic garden. So this looks like a rural map, but naturally it's an English garden. So that's places where people would often go for class hunts and things like that, as well as ladies who go for walks. Right? So the building that we have for this time period, we were going to do a go formative, but I think we've run out of time. So not, or we won't have enough time for all of it. So let's go ahead and just see if we can go for this. Does anyone know who the architect of this building is? Has anyone been here? This is in the United States. Does anyone know? Thomas Jefferson. I'm sorry, Katie, can you say it again? Thomas Jefferson. This is Thomas Jefferson. This is Monticello. So this is the home of, Montes of, of Thomas Jefferson, but he built himself. He was a gentleman architect. So he was not a trained architect. He trained himself by reading lots and lots of books. Okay, so this is his country home. He used the neoclassical style. So this was a style that was popular in England and France. Right, so how is it neoclassical, right? It has a temple front. So it's got a triangular pediment, it's got a porch, it's got columns. Behind the porch is a dome, right? So you can see it has a central plan dome. It's symmetrical, right? So if I put a line right through the middle, it's equal on both sides, right? It's got um, a pediment above the doorway. It's got um, regularity and spacing. It's very much based on logic and order. Now this does have a little bit of American style to it. He used Georgian brick. So we actually used um, this red brick that was really common in the Americas. And he contrasted that against the white of the cornice at the top. So he was influenced by, you know, Palladian style, but he was also interested in French architecture. And this is a very famous structure um, called the Hotel de Salon in Paris. Why would Monticello be modeled after French architecture? Does anyone know some of the history of Thomas Jefferson? And why would he model his home after something French? Does anyone know? He was a French ambassador. So in his political career, that was one of his jobs. He was an ambassador to France. And so he was very interested in the architecture of France of the day. And so this is the plan for Monticello. So you can see that it too has bilateral symmetry. You divide it through the middle. It's pretty much equal on both sides. And you can go to this website if you want to explore room after room after room. Right? And he not only was the architect of, of his own home, but he was also the architect of the, the Virginia legislature. So these buildings on the bottom left is the House and the Senate. Um, in Virginia, and then this is the library at the University of Virginia. And so notice how the, the library looked a lot like the Pantheon, right, of ancient Rome. And then the house, state house looks like um, an ancient Roman temple. Um, this is probably something important to say or to talk about. Why is so much American architecture neoclassical? Why would all this early American architecture be neoclassical? What do you think? For a few minutes here? Is it because like the theme was kind of like revolutionary and that's what America was like born on? Right. We're 
coming from post-revolution. And so they're trying to show the legitimacy of a new government and a new nation. And so what is stoic? What is calm? What is rational? So much of our vocabulary of democracy and the republic and the Senate, like all these words, right, come from ancient Rome. And so they were very much inspired by the architecture of ancient Rome. And then, of course, ancient Greek, it goes hand in hand with that, to make them look prestigious. You make your buildings look prestigious, it gives you prestige. Right? So they were trying to rebel against English architecture because, of course, he came from English architecture. They came from England, right? They used to be the property of England. They would rather go to France to look for inspiration than England. But I do think that there are some English characteristics. I mean, this one, right, that we looked at before that was based on Palladian style, it's got the same sort of zone that you see here. Right? The last piece that we have is a sculpture of George Washington by Jean Antoine Houdin. And Houdin was a French sculptor. So, this very early American sculpture, right, was done by a French architect, or, or excuse me, a French sculptor. And the reason is that there were just not enough American artists working, right? Because in America, right, there was no art academy. There wasn't a lot of art training. People had to go overseas. Probably the best known American painter was the Fields. And you've probably seen famous portraits of like George Washington by the Field brothers. But Houdon knew Jefferson. He knew um, uh, Benjamin Franklin. Sorry, my brain was a little fried. And so he was hired to uh, make a sculpture of George, of, of George Washington by uh, the Virginia legislature. And so when you look at the style of, sorry, if you look at the style of um, Houdin, you'll notice that he's very much inspired by Roman realism, right? Remember Roman realism? That's super, super realistic to the point where people look older than they actually are, right? So that image of Voltaire here looks very realistic, right? And so they had to go out of the country to hire. I actually think that, if I remember right, Kuzan got a portrait, like someone made a portrait map of Jefferson and sent it to him and made some sketches. And he tried to make a sculpture and it wasn't good enough. So we actually had to travel to the United States to uh, work from, um, I think, the death back for George Washington or from George Washington. That part, I can't remember if Washington was, had passed away by then. Um, but the style of sculpture is very much inspired by the world, right? So, How is it classical, right? How is it classical? He has contrapasso. He's calm. Look at his face. He's balanced and he's proportional, right? He might be even like late classical. To me, he seems like he's larger than life. Doesn't his body look really big for his head? Right? There's a lot of symbolism in this sculpture, right? So how is it symbolic of America? And how is it, it how is it based on how Washington wanted to be portrayed? If you remember, Washington essentially only had two, like he put a limit to his presidency, right? So there at the at the beginning of our country there was a term limit. But Washington said, I want to step back from government eventually because I don't want to be seen as a king, right? So what was he before? A soldier. He was a farmer. So he wanted to be portrayed as a farmer. So actually he had a plow, right? This object over to the side is actually a plow head 
to show that he is a gentleman farmer, also to show the prosperity of our country, right? He has a gentleman walking stick, right? His left arm is raised or is resting on a bundle of 13 rods. Of course, the 13 represents the 13 states, right? The 13 states. And it represents the deep sort of service plural, this idea that all of those states are united as one country, right? Out of many, one. So I'm going to leave you guys with this. This is not the only portrait of George Washington, right? This is by Greenow, right? Isn't that shocking? I've never seen this in real life. I would love to see this sculpture, right? Can you see how George Washington did not want to be portrayed as a farmer, right? Here he's portrayed as a god. Doesn't he look like he's Zeus, right? He doesn't have a beard, but his arm, the way his angle, right? And he's got a classical toga. Kind of interesting. This was after his presidency. This actually is a much later sculpture. I think it's kind of an interesting. So, American sculpture, right, made by a French artist, right, with a lot of realism and symbolism to portray him as a farmer, not a king. Okay, we're done for today. Are there any questions? Okay, so I'll see Aaron and Isabel at 145 and then Brianna will see you at 735 tomorrow. Okay. Um I'll see you guys again on Monday. Goodbye.